Hello watch lovers, friends old and new, welcome back to the channel. My name is Stian and today we're going to look at this beautiful old Oris watch. Oris has a very peculiar story as a brand, we'll get to that. But first let's get to the giveaway of the Seagull watch. Drum roll please. So Sean Pomeroy, please stand up or sit down, cannot really see you anyway. But I'll reply to your winning comment and then we'll take it from there. Thanks to everyone for uh, participating and there will actually be a second giveaway in this video. But first a little something for the gunk fetishists among you. Look at this man. It's a beautiful green color though I have to say. Anyway, back to the watch we're looking at. It's an Oris I believe from the late 1950s. You see it has gold plating and it's actually in pretty good condition. Stainless steel back. The dial uh, looks alright. A little bit difficult to see under that uh, badly scratched uh, crystal. The watch uh, was not running but then all of a sudden started running anyway. But I cannot set the time or the date obviously. And putting it on the time grapher, we see it's not going to win any accuracy competitions. And the beat error is very high. Let's get the case back off and see what kind of movement is uh, hiding inside this watch. That's the Oris 394 movement. It might not be obvious at first glance, but this is actually a pin pallet movement. Let's uh, try to get the stem out. It's actually stuck pretty badly. So we have to be a little bit creative, but it comes out uh, without too much trouble. But it always gives a little bit of a scare when you uh, have a stuck crown, often an indication of uh, rust. The movement is also a bit reluctant to uh, come out of the case. So again, a little bit of a scare there. We'll have to see exactly uh, what's causing this, but uh, we do manage to get the movement out. And the dial uh, looks uh, very nice, actually. I see the autofocus of my uh, top camera is a little bit confused with this uh, shiny black dial. Sorry about that. But from the sideways views, we can uh, see the dial is in really good shape. It's a sector dial, which is uh, always a little bit special. Pretty unusual setup uh, with a date there. As we'll see later, it's a very, very simple implementation of uh, the date complication. Then again, date complications are uh, not that common with uh, pin pallet movements anyway. So I did another video on uh, pin pallet movement uh, quite a while back. And that was uh, used to explain why the Swiss watch industry suffered so badly uh, during the so-called quartz crisis or quartz revolution. And a big part of the reason uh, the Swiss watch industry almost uh, went completely down was that they produced tons of cheap pin pallet movements, which obviously stood no chance against uh, quartz when the quartz became affordable. But if you compare the pin pallet movement in that uh, ruler watch I uh, went through in that video to this one, there's a world of difference. You might have seen on the dial it said the 17 joules, and that's at least as many as uh, normal Swiss lever escapement movement had at that time. So what gives? Why would Oris make a 17 joule pin pallet escapement? Well, that is uh, part of what makes Oris such a cool brand to uh, learn a little bit about. It's not an old brand, just a little bit older than Rolex. They were established uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. And early on they made the pocket watches, of course, as everyone did in the early 1900s. 
And then I started making a few watches with the pin palette escapement, which is uh, also very common at the time. And then they were kind of blindsided by uh, the Swiss government. The government passed uh, the Uhrenstatut in uh, 1934. It was intended to uh, help uh, protect the watch industry. But what it did was to actually ban companies from adopting new technologies that they weren't already using. Which sounds like a really, really bad idea. And yes, it was a bad idea. But what that meant for Ori specifically was that they could not start making watches with the lever escapement. Because they hadn't been using it. And all until the late 1960s. They actually were banned from uh, being able to use uh, normal Swiss lever escapements. So they were kind of stuck with a pin pallet escapement. The pin pallet escapement is an inferior escapement. There's no doubt about that. So for Oris, it was kind of like being in a boxing match and being told they can only fight with their left hand. Not entirely fair. But they had already invested and were actually a pretty big watchmaker at the time. So there wasn't really an option to just uh, quit. So what they did, they rolled up their sleeves and uh, did a really good job out of it. They created some pretty iconic models. Maybe the pointer date is the best known one. And in the 60s, uh, they first came up with an automatic uh, movement, automatic pin pallet movement. That's not common at all. And they even managed to have a pin pallet movement chronometer certified. So yeah, they took a bad hand and uh, really played it uh, to perfection, I would say. And then in the late 1960s, when Oris was allowed, finally, to uh, start making uh, lever escapement uh, watches, just like all other Swiss brands, that was just a few years before the quartz crisis. So Oris was uh, quite badly hit. They were uh, bought up by Aswag, the forerunner to Swatch. And things were obviously not looking too great for a while then. And at this point, I think it's uh, only reasonable that I introduce uh, an old misogynistic story from uh, Norway. Kind of a fairy tale, I suppose. For the Norwegians, it's the story of uh, Kjæringa Motströmmen. The story basically goes like this. A man was uh, married to a woman who was uh, so cross and difficult uh, that she never ever wanted to do the same thing that uh, he wanted to do. And eventually he kind of drowned her. And honestly, when I hear this story now, I was like, what the devil did they teach kids back in the 60s? But anyway, so he accidentally drowned her. And then uh, the day after they uh, wanted to bury her properly and they couldn't find her. And then the husband said that, well, you know, that uh, woman was so uh, against everything that she probably she's uh, not uh, lying downstream, but upstream. And indeed, they found that the body had floated upstream, even over a waterfall. So that's how uh, difficult the woman was. And I'm not telling this story because I think it's a good story, because it's obviously a completely horrible story. But there's a little bit of a parallel to uh, Oris. Not that Oris is difficult or anything, but they really did go their own way. A little bit more about that in a second. Ice cream. Ice cream? You scream. That's not ice cream. <laughs> oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Look, you both take Papa's ice cream? Yeah, I just turned no. it. I just turned it into your eye, man. Both of you. Nothing left to pop on it. Take a bite. Well, at least my daughter let me have a bite of my own ice cream. Anyway, as I was saying before the ice cream debacle, Oris uh, did go their own way. They uh, did a management buyout in uh, 1980. And they decided to uh, focus exclusively on mechanical watches. Which was obviously completely opposite to what Pretty much all other uh, companies were doing at the time. And uh, looking at their current lineup, uh, they actually have a really, really nice collection of watches. 
not very expensive. Their uh, top line, the uh, Artelier or Artelier line is uh, the most expensive, but most of these watches are, uh, let's say, Tissot level or uh, Longines level uh, pricing. And they are creating their own movements as well. Everything is in-house, uh, basically. So yeah, absolutely a brand uh, worth checking out. In the meanwhile, we managed to uh, take the watch apart. It's obviously not a very complicated watch. And then we can put it through our cleaning machine. With the cleaning machine busy, we can turn our attention to the case. You might have seen on the dial it said uh, waterproof, and that's not true. It wasn't true back in the 50s or 60s, and it's not true now for sure. And that old gasket uh, doesn't really do much. So we're going to clean the case back and uh, put it through the ultrasonic together with the case. So the case uh, looks pretty good. A bit scratched, obviously, and a little bit flaking on uh, the lugs. But uh, really not bad for the age. So we're going to put it through the ultrasonic. And with the case back from the ultrasonic, we can uh, remove the case tube so that we can polish the case a little bit. What's worth uh, being aware of is that uh, every time you polish a case, you do remove metal. So for all kinds of cases, uh, there's basically a limit to how much you can polish or how often, if you will. Because of course, removing metal also means that you're going to change the shape a little bit. And especially vulnerable is anything that's plated. Because uh, when you polish, you will remove the plating uh, very quickly. This watch uh, was made back in the 50s, I believe, uh, when uh, they didn't do plating. They did uh, either gold fill or a gold cap. So this one is gold filled, 10K. So we can polish it uh, very gently, but uh, it's not going to be able to withstand a lot of polishing. So the case has, uh, let's say, an integrated bezel. So trying to keep uh, the shape of that one, and then we can uh, hand polish uh, the rest of the case. I'm not showing all the different steps here, but uh, we do manage to get a shine in the end. We'll see that uh, later. Let's then uh, turn our attention to the movement. Not in any way a complicated movement, obviously. It is, uh, let's say, a high-grade, low-grade movement in the sense that it's a uh, pin pallet, but it's uh, got a lot of jewels and it is uh, made with uh, very good uh, worksmanship overall. Let's see, the, even the finishing is actually quite nice. Pin pallet movements are by design uh, thicker than, uh, let's say, lever escapements because the pin pallets actually stand up instead of uh, being flat and horizontal. We'll see a little bit close-up of that uh, a bit later. First, let's get uh, the mainspring back into the barrel. said it before, and I'm uh, happy to repeat it again. Watchmakers are tool junkies. But a mainspring winder like uh, this one is uh, pretty much a must when you work on watches uh, relatively often. 
I do make uh, cheaper ones now than uh, these ones. And I just saw a video of uh, someone having 3D printed ones, which would be even cheaper. So uh, check that out. With the main spring back in the barrel, we're going to put a little bit of grease on top of the main spring as well. Put a little bit at the bottom. With uh, watches, uh, less is more. You should not be able to see that you lubricated things. Most lubrication spreads uh, relatively easily. So if you put too much, it's going to go to places you don't want it. But we do want to lubricate uh, friction points. And uh, this is one of them cap jewels where the pivots on the balance staff uh, rest when the watch is uh, horizontal. So most pin pellet movement wouldn't even have jewels uh, there. Most of them would uh, simply run in, uh, in the plate, metal bearings, not even bearings, just the plate. This one has uh, shock settings, uh, proper shock settings from uh, KIF called the Trior. Can be a little bit uh, difficult to uh, place properly. There is this uh, little tool you can see here with uh, three uh, prongs on it that you basically just press down and rotate and then it's uh, quite easy. So with um, both shock settings in, let's see if uh, the balance oscillates uh, freely. Yeah, that looks nice. Then we can uh, proceed with uh, the rest of the movement. One uh, thing that's pretty unique and pretty cool with this movement is that uh, the exact same movement can be used for both uh, center seconds and small seconds dials. You simply just move this uh, central uh, arbor and replace it with that wheel there. It would give you an extra wheel that doesn't really do much if you have it in a small seconds configuration, but it's a pretty cool thing. Shows that uh, someone did put some uh, thought into this uh, movement. Another thing they also did was to standardize the screws. And thank God, man. Working on that uh, seagull movement was pretty nightmarish because you're kind of used to a certain, uh, what should I say, standardization more or less when it comes to screws from uh, Swiss watches. But in a seagull, it was all over the place. So quite uh, confusing. So the keen observer might have noticed that I actually forgot something in the previous. Uh, 30 seconds. Let me know in the comments if you uh, spotted uh, what I forgot. It's always a bad sign if you have a part left in your tray after you uh, think you finished the watch. Not that it got that far, but still. So I uh, said in the beginning that there would be another giveaway in this video. And it will indeed. I will give away the other Seagull watch. That was this uh, dark one that's a little bit bigger than uh, the white one. Go back to uh, the Seagull video if you want to see this in a little bit more detail. I'm just uh, quickly showing it again here. The rules are basically the same. Just uh, subscribe, like and leave a comment. Then you're eligible for uh, the draw. The draw will be on uh, Saturday in two weeks. Shipping will be free of charge. I will not contact anyone until Saturday in two weeks. If someone says, uh, contact me on Telegram, they're a scammer. And we hate scammers. All right, back to the Oris. As you can see, there's a lot of jewels uh, in this one. And it has uh, these uh, clear jewels. Just to be clear, uh, we typically think of uh, these jewels or uh, rubies as red, but that's just the color. 
can be yellow or green or blue or whatever you want and uh, clear as uh, these are. Keep in mind there's no uh, palette jewels. So all the 17 jewels in this movement are uh, elsewhere. So they basically have a couple of extra. I don't uh, recall, for instance, ever having seen another movement uh, with an extra capstone on the top of the palette pivot. So that's kind of fun. Might also be a little bit of a marketing thing that uh, when people see 17 jewels on the dial, they automatically think it's a lever escapement. All right, we're getting close to assembling the base movement. Let's uh, look at the keyless works because they're a bit different. Kind of cool, I think. The setting lever basically just floats, so you cannot turn the plate upside down. So I'm using a little piece of Rodico to hold it there while we screw the, the setting lever screw down. It is a kind of a rocker mechanism on the keyless works. And in this movement, there's a kind of combined uh, winding pinion and a sliding pinion as well. It is a simpler and uh, in some ways perhaps a cruder uh, solution than uh, what we're used to. But it's also a pretty nifty and uh, elegant solution in my view. And yeah, I have to do something about those nose hairs again. But uh, what can I say? My wife uh, won't likes it that way. And you know what they say. Happy wife, happy life. Probably goes the other way also. Unhappy wife, unhappy life. Yeah, kind of sounds familiar. Again, I'm sure the wives would have a similar saying for us husbands. Anyway, we're putting some uh, D5 on the various pivots. On the arbor for the cannon pinion, we're using a 9504. Last uh, plate in the keyless works is this uh, setting lever uh, spring. Probably better to call it a setting lever plate or even a, just a cover plate. Because we see the spring actually does not uh, directly work on the setting lever. It works on this little post in the plate and uh, this allows the whole mechanism to rock back and forth. Pretty uh, cool solution, I think. Let's see this uh, rocker in action. I like rockers. Just uh, really cool, I think. Anyway, now you might see what I missed before. There should be a ratchet wheel on the underside of uh, the barrel. Luckily, this uh, movement is uh, very easy to uh, take the barrel in and out. Just release two screws and that's it, so uh, not a lot of time wasted. Also like the design of the click and the click spring. It's pretty much standard on the pin pallet uh, movements that uh, the click and the click spring are on the dial side. Then we can put the pallet in and uh, here you can see the pallet. There are no jewels on it. You have two pins on each side. Those pins are typically just uh, polished steel. There are some pin pallet movements, or were rather, with uh, jewels actually there, but uh, very rare. And let's uh, have a little look then also on uh, the escape wheel teeth and see how uh, different they are as well. Here you can see the pin that's standing straight up there. This is then the exit pin. So we see the pin locks with the teeth in uh, quite a different way. And the escape wheel teeth are also shaped much uh, simpler than in the lever escapement. The way we lubricate uh, this escapement is also a bit different because uh, the pins do not uh, keep the oil. 
So we're basically going to oil a few teeth on the escape wheel instead. And when I say oil, I obviously mean grease. From a bitrate perspective, we should be fine using oil, but given that the escapement just does not retain oil, uh, we use uh, grease instead. Alright, with that done, uh, let's uh, put the balance back in and uh, see how this baby runs. Well, it does run at least. We're going to oil uh, the various pivots. We're using uh, D5 or HP1300 for uh, the slower wheels. And then the 9010 for the faster ones. So it does run fairly okay. We see the beat uh, error is still uh, pretty big, but it's got a nice amplitude. There's no easy way to correct the beat error on this movement, so we have to adjust the collet on the balance staff. So the first thing I do is to let down the mainspring and then I give it a little puff and basically see where the lever stops on the left side or the right side of center. And then we can take the balance off. And then we simply have to move the collet a little bit on the arbor. When I say a little bit, I mean a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit. That's a little bit. Maybe that's even too much, but at least we get in the vicinity of uh, what we want to achieve. Not exactly a beautiful uh, straight lines. I did take uh, the pallet fork out again and cleaned it, uh, but uh, the problem is somewhere there. Last thing we have to do then is to uh, put on the, the date uh, mechanism. Very rudimentary. There's no quick set whatsoever. Or there is one, but it's called the uh, muscle quick set. You have to basically just turn the hands through midnight uh, as many times as you need to do. You might have noticed um, before that the dial isn't completely centered. If we zoom in a little bit on the dial, you can see that uh, there's more space on the left side of the arbor than uh, on the right side. The way to correct that is to uh, bend the dial feet. You can do that with uh, tweezers or you can also do it with uh, pin vise or something like that. The reason this is important is that uh, if the dial is too much uh, off-center, it may lead to uh, the hour hand uh, to rub against the edge of the dial and uh, that's going to impact the timekeeping, of course. To place the hands, we first turn the crown so that uh, the date changes, then we know it's midnight. We can place the hour hand at uh, 12. And then it's a rinse and repeat with the minute hand. We just want to check that uh, the hour hand uh, rotates freely, does not uh, scrub the dial or anything, so that it's parallel to the dial.
That really is a nice tile. Beautiful watch overall. So this uh, movement beats at 18,000 beats per hour. And in terms of ticks and tocks, that means five ticks per second. While high bit uh, watches have at least eight beats per second. And that makes the second sand move much more fluidly. You can see this uh, second sand really does uh, not move too fluidly. Well, especially when it's in slow motion, but uh, anyway, still a beautiful dial. All right, one of the last things we need to do before we can put the watch on the wrist is to put in a new crystal. As long as uh, the crystal is standard size, we're going to just put in a new one. There's no point wasting time and effort on uh, trying to polish out uh, the scratches of an old one unless it's an original crystal or something special about it. When we say crystal for vintage watches, it's uh, typically then plexiglass or hesolite or plastic or call it what you want. But it means we can compress it a little bit and then we can uh, gently press it into the case. That looks a lot better. The stem uh, movement is a little bit more, um, what's the word, rough in these kinds of uh, pin pallet movements. But it does the trick. Last thing then, we need to put a new gasket in for the case back. And we need to shave our nose hair. Gray nose hair, man. What a treat. With the case back on, the watch is pretty much ready to uh, wear. We're going to find a new strap. And no, we're not going to reuse the spring bars either. Before seeing the watch on the wrist, I just want to remind everyone that you can find the nicest vintage watches online at vintagewatchservices.eu. We stock 100 watches of the good brands at any given time, all serviced with a warranty. So check that out if you're in the market. And there we have the Oris. Beautiful watch, 1950s. Looks splendid. I hope you like this video. Be sure to uh, subscribe, like, and leave a comment if you want to join uh, the draw for the seagull. We'll be back with another video shortly. Until then, ta-ta. <laughs>